I was in medical school at Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, I marveled time and time again at the resiliency of the human spirit. And it all started on my front doorstep with Brian. Let me tell you about him. Brian sat on the stoop of my apartment in Dublin. He was a fixture there, somewhat like the cobblestones on the street. We shared very brief exchanges over time. Often, I would find Brian chatting away and laughing hysterically. He told me that he was talking with his friends, but although I could see Brian, I never could see these friends he was always talking to. It was as if they weren't really there. Over time, Brian never asked me for money or food. Once, he commented that no one else in the building had ever said hello or even acknowledged him. That surprised me because, you see, I would have had to either step on Brian or leap over him just to make it out of the front door. One day, I was heading off for class, and I initiated my usual exchange with Brian. Hi, have a good day. And that's when he stopped me. He said, I'm going away, and I wanted to say goodbye. Thank you. It's been really nice talking with someone who wasn't only in my head. What do you think about when you hear the phrase mental illness? The Centers for Disease Control cites a study where people were asked a bunch of questions regarding perceptions on mental illness. When asked, do you think that treatment can help people with mental illness go on to lead normal lives? Check this out. 90% said yes. Overwhelmingly, people get it. Treatment helps. But when asked, do you think that people are caring and sympathetic towards the mentally ill? Of those surveyed who reported no mental health symptoms of their own, only 50% said yes. And of those surveyed who did report some mental health symptoms of their own, only 25% said yes. People are caring and sympathetic towards the mentally ill. These findings highlight a significant clash between our understanding of mental illness and our acceptance of it. But I have hope, and this is a hope that I need all of you to share with me. Hope that together we can transform perceptions of mental illness from stigma into acceptance. During my time in Ireland, I was also finding out how literary geniuses had shared stories that helped give mental illness an acceptable voice. Stigma surely contributed to the loneliness experienced by Brian. A disheveled man, apparently homeless, loitering on the streets and incessantly talking to himself. Judging from his looks, you might have thought that he was mad or possibly even dangerous. Admittedly, during training, my own perceptions on mental illness were significantly challenged and transformed. I'll share with you a curious fact about me. I had no intention of becoming a psychiatrist. No, I went to medical school so I could be hands-on, patch up wounds, cure diseases, and make people better. But like all physicians in training, I had to do a clinical rotation in psychiatry. Up until that point, my knowledge on the subject was mostly gleaned from depictions and old movies, and I could feel a certain something lurking inside of me. Stigma. The first time I stepped foot inside a locked psychiatric unit, I was equally intimidated and thrilled. Questions ran through my mind, and at the top of the list was this. Am I safe amongst patients on a psych ward? 
I came out of that rotation unscathed. My month-long stint in psychiatry had proven that the locked unit and the patients within were completely devoid of the histrionic fantasies that dominated the cinema and my imagination. Still, I was somewhat skeptical. That rotation had involved a lot of sitting around and talking and listening. There wasn't always a whole lot of action. And I couldn't help but wonder, are patients experiencing any real change from all this talking and listening business? My next clinical rotation as a medical student was on surgery. What a relief, no more talking about feelings. I finally got to experience that laying on of hands aspect of medicine. On the day before a big operation, I met my patient at her bedside. She was this little old lady just peeking out from underneath her blankets. She made eye contact with me and asked, What's going to happen? Well, with the brash confidence befitting a medical student eager to impress, I went on in extreme detail, mind you, <laughs> to describe the nuances of that operation. That little old lady just stared at me, completely unimpressed. All she said was, it's going to rain tomorrow. When the next day finally came, it didn't rain, it poured. During the operation, my mentor reassured me. He commended my dexterity with the scalpel and steadiness under pressure. But despite these accolades, I felt drenched in disappointment. I had foolishly lost sight of the fact that behind this rare disease and impossibly exciting operation was an infinitely complex human being, one who had tried to reach out to me. I stood there at the operating table with my patient. My hands were inside of her. I was saturated in her blood. But sadly, I had never even touched her. I tell you this story about surgery, and I could tell you a dozen more like it. Times when I had been given the opportunity to learn more about a patient's story. But instead, I focused on what was tangible, failing to explore the complexities within. These experiences ignited my passion to learn more about all that talking and listening business. Could it contribute, I wondered, to creating health? Entering medical school, I had envisioned my role as a doctor would be to heal others. But to my surprise, psychiatry grabbed my attention when I finally understood how it is these doctors who can give patients the tools to heal themselves. As my training progressed, it became clear to me that mental illness, while not always tangible, is a very serious medical condition. It's something that won't just go away because you want it to. What surprised me, and might surprise you too, is that mental illness is a master at disguise. Not everybody looks like Brian. In fact, you often do not know who right around you looks just fine, but is really struggling. People tend to suffer in silence because of fear and shame. Consider this, one in four people will find themselves diagnosed with a major mental disorder. Moreover, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, on average, people wait nearly a decade after the onset of their symptoms to seek treatment. 
During that decade, relationships often fall apart, jobs are lost, and stability disappears. According to the World Health Organization, depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. The WHO also reports that there is one death by suicide every 40 seconds. To put that into perspective, by the end of this talk, 27 people will have terminated their lives. Brian might have been one of them. I'll never know, but I often hope that he found his way into treatment. As I pursued training in psychiatry, I met men and women who did seek help, and I witnessed how they were able to use treatment involving any combination of medicine and therapy to create bright futures. I believe that George Bernard Shaw said it best. Life isn't about finding yourself. Life is about creating yourself. Let me introduce you to one more such man whom I learned about at Trinity. His name is Jonathan. Here's Jonathan's story. He had lived a full life where he enjoyed traveling, writing, and spending time with friends. He was active in his church and a well-respected member of his community. Growing up, Jonathan had been a deep thinker and at times a harsh judge of human nature. As for his mood, well, it fluctuated. People described him as being prone to bouts of brooding where he would become severely depressed and isolate. But then, at other times, his mood would flip and he'd be simply giddy. As Jonathan grew older, he was finding himself in failing health and his brooding became worse. He began to withdraw and isolate, became severely depressed, he lost interest in church, stopped traveling, and friends scarcely heard from him. It got to the point where Jonathan couldn't get out of bed, and he even stopped talking. Let me tell you what happened to Jonathan next. He was cast aside and labeled a lunatic. However, Jonathan did not let his story end with the stigma of lunacy. In fact, Jonathan is Jonathan Swift. He is best known as the author of Gulliver's Travels. It is less well known that Swift was declared of unsound mind by a commission of lunacy in the 18th century. Swift chose not to be defined by that label and he did remarkable things. He mastered the art of communication, and through lyrical and sensitive prose, his writings broke stereotypes and quelled fears of the unknown. Swift positively advocated for better treatment of the mentally ill, and he did this by donating his fortune to the development of a freestanding psychiatric hospital in Dublin, St. Patrick's Hospital which is where I had the good fortune to train. And Swift was empowered. He envisioned a world that would appreciate the mind and the body as linked together, not separate entities. And it was in that spirit that he had his psychiatric hospital built right next to a general medical hospital. Today, my work as a psychiatrist is on a loft psychiatric unit within a busy general medical hospital in Boston. Every day, patients cross our threshold, finding themselves behind a locked door. But I am pleased to say that overwhelmingly, these same patients are creating bright futures where they are able to free themselves from the imposed barriers of their illness. There is recovery, there is healing, 
and there is hope. We all have the power to create communities that are filled with acceptance and mental health. I believe that there are at least three major misperceptions about mental illness that contribute to stigma. First, that mental illness is shameful. Second, that having a mental illness means a living death sentence. And third, that we can't do anything about it. And so, in the spirit of Jonathan Swift, I offer to you my modest proposal. First, talk about mental illness. Share your thoughts and your feelings with your family, your friends, and your doctors. Opening doors to a dialogue about mental illness can be uncomfortable. It makes me uneasy, much in the same way that I feel uneasy not knowing whatever happened to Brian. But that is exactly why these conversations are so important, so we can generate concern, interest, and solutions to a very common problem. Second, be positive. A mental illness is not a hopeless condition. Just like diabetes and heart disease, it is a chronic condition that can be managed. Just like all qualified psychiatrists, I consider an individual's risks and strengths equally when offering a treatment plan. By focusing on health promoting factors like education, employment, relationships, and hobbies, people can go on to create bright futures. Surviving a major mental illness and thriving in this world are not dichotomous. A mental illness might alter one's trajectory, but it does not have to define it. Third, embrace your power. Change begins with each of us. We are all affected, and so we all have to be a part of the solution. Did you know that the number of psychiatric hospital beds in the United States has fallen from half a million in the 1950s to just about 100,000 today? You are empowered to ask your legislators to identify programs that support psychiatric awareness, research, and funding. Ask your community innovators to make mental health programs more accessible. And the next time someone you love tells you that they are bleak in spirit and losing hope, tell them this, I'll hold onto hope for you. I'll give it back when you're feeling better. There are plenty of misperceptions about mental illness. But this is a story in progress. Let's write the ending together. An ending where we stop finding ourselves victims of disease and start creating communities that are filled with acceptance and mental health. And I leave you today with parting words from Jonathan Swift. May you live all the days of your life. Thank you.